company David Nieper Limited is a 60 year old family business, as Philippa said, producing high quality women's wear. And the company employs 300 staff manufacturing in Alfred and Derbyshire and has never gone offshore in search of cheap labour, always choosing to train and invest in local skills, in contrast to the wider British fashion sector, which sources 97% of all clothing offshore. The company sells direct to private consumers, a third of whom are overseas buyers. I visited David Nieper in February 2017 to run a training day, and I was shown around their production facilities afterwards. The production is to a large extent vertical, and there is an exceptional working environment. I was particularly impressed to see that employees are responsible for making the entire garment, and the pride and satisfaction that they took in their work was completely evident, unlike many other similar companies. So our speaker today is Christopher Nieper, CEO, Chief Executive of this family fashion business, David Nieper. He's a businessman, an educationist, also the founder and chair of the David Nieper Educational Trust and the Christopher Nieper Foundation. These organizations are actively invest in the skills of the local community. And it's a, triple, a typical trait of all things Nieper. Um, a side of sustainability that is not really fully or widely recognized. The company received a Queen's Award for Sustainable Development in 2020, the only Derbyshire company ever to have received this award. In 2020, Christopher was awarded an OBE for services to manufacturing and apprenticeship development. And in 2022, he became Deputy Lord Lieutenant for the County of Derbyshire. So from my perspective, he's an entrepreneur and an inspirational speaker, and we're delighted to have him here today. Um, he'll be speaking about the work of his company, its charitable foundation, and their current initiatives, one of which is the Carbon Checker, which we look forward to hearing about. In short, I'm charged to tell you that this is a view behind the scenes of a British fashion house with tips on how to survive over 60 years. Um, we look forward to hearing about those tips. Christopher, thank you very much. That's an extremely generous introduction. Thank you very much, Janet. Thank you very much, Philippa. It's a, it's a huge pleasure to be, to be with you this afternoon. And I'm sure all of you are from much more accredited um, textile backgrounds than I am. Ours is a, a small-ish family business. And as Janet's pointed out, we've been here for, for 60 years. You've actually asked me to talk about how we might be able to lead in some way um, Britain um, setting a real example or becoming an exemplar of, of reaching net zero and how we could lead the global effort. Well, I'm going to try to frame that in, in our own environment and what we're doing here, because, of course, fashion is about a lot of things, including, including carbon. I'm going to give you a bit of an insight into the idea of this carbon checker label, which would be a label which we would intend to hang on the garments. I'm going to give you a little bit of background into the history of our company, which was started by my parents. I'm going to show you behind the scenes in the sewing, in the knitwear we do, uh, in printing of catalogues and in printing of fabric, textiles, dyeing, etc. And also what we're doing in the way of educational skills. And I'm going to end with a, a very short video which we prepared for COP26, which I think sums up the, you know, the carbon challenge, which we've got. Now, all being well, I'm gonna share my screen, and I hope you'll be able to see um, one or two slides that we've put together here. Can you, is that okay? Can, does that mean anything? Can you see that, Janet? Yes, yes that's perfect. That's great. Yeah. Okay. It, it might actually surprise you that um, I could complain about fashion and textiles when the whole of our working life, my whole career has been dedicated to this sector, but I think it's a bit of an embarrassment that fashion is one of the world's worst polluting industries. It's true that fashion produces somewhere between five and eight percent of global emissions, and that adds up, you know, to a staggering 1.2 billion tonnes of carbon being pushed into the atmosphere every year. And that is worse, by the way, than all of 
global aviation and maritime shipping combined. And I think that's a disgrace, really. But, you know, it's not just carbon. Fashion is responsible for other things as well. Polluting is one of the worst things. Look at this. This is a terrible image I have here, which was from a um, BBC documentary of rivers being polluted by textiles. And of course, we're putting microfibers into the oceans, the uh, labor, um, you know, the kind of labor conditions that are going on in some of these factories is not what we should be proud of, etc. And I think over the last 30 years, where I've been involved in, in fashion in the company, we've managed to lose 97% of all the fashion from this country. And with it, of course, we've lost 97% of the jobs. And that has destroyed local communities like this one. And our community is a small town actually called Orferton, which was a coal mining town. And in this town 30 years ago, most of the men would have worked in the mines and most of the women would have worked in textiles. The mines, of course, have now gone and most of the textiles have gone. So it's um, a little bit disingenuous, I think, when the fashion industry talks about itself being worth 26 billion to the UK economy, when we're actually only making 3% of that here. Um, and according to the ONS, we are employing amongst the country around 26,000 jobs in fashion and textile manufacture. That doesn't mean fashion and textile retail or logistics, it means manufacture. So there's only 26,000 jobs here. And if that represents 3%, then if we could get 3% more fashion made in the UK, then wouldn't that create 26,000 more jobs? And there would be new jobs and there'd be long-term jobs and there'd be skilled jobs. And many of them would be in forgotten communities like this. But imagine if we could get a 5% swing onshore or a 10% swing onshore, you wouldn't have thought it impossible to achieve that. But I'm hoping that the carbon checker idea concept we have has the potential at least to achieve just that. Let's just come back to the basis of all this. I don't think we can tackle, um, we can't tackle pollution in other countries. We can't tackle the labor conditions in other countries. What we can do is talk about greenhouse emissions. And that is much the most poignant thing in the news today. COP26, of course, was all about global warming. You know, the, the conference in Glasgow just before Christmas and global warming, greenhouse gas emissions, fossil fuels, price of energy. Those are the things which are really affecting consumers now. And what this bar chart is showing us is the greenhouse gas emissions from a typical factory offshore. In this case, we're taking the Far East and a typical factory in the UK. And it may be the writing's a little bit small at the top, but the blue bar at the top is retail. The yellow bar in just below it is distribution. And the gray bar is clothing production, which means sewing. Then all of the rest, uh, the orange part is fiber, textile production, and the bit at the bottom is raw materials. So the astonishing thing about this is that even if we can reduce the carbon emissions, from what we're doing here, all we're doing is shrinking those top three bars here. So the bulk of it, uh, of the fashion of the uh, emissions are still there. And I think they can be tackled. And we have tackled um, certainly the next bar down, the fiber production by producing all our own fabrics now in the UK. I'll come to that again in a moment. So the idea is to introduce a label, which is not a complicated, um, construction based on how many times the garment is worn or how it's washed or what temperature it's washed or whether it's landfill or um, the pollution from the dyeing, the finishing. It's based on carbon emissions because that's the one thing which we actually can measure. And that's the one thing the government is asking us to measure to get to net zero. And the thing is, if we could reduce carbon, the, um, which consumers would like to do, then I think that would drive jobs into the UK. Because the way to reduce carbon is to manufacture locally and not bring things halfway around the world. And the thing about the UK grid is about half of our electricity in the UK already comes from sustainable sources. That's wind, solar, etc. And so just by making the identical garment with the identical machinery 
in the UK instead of offshore, you're already halving the carbon emissions. And the idea of this is a simple at a glance label, which shows a consumer how environmentally friendly their garment is. But there's no plan from government to do anything much about it. And I think it's time to take carbon off the catwalk. And we have challenged the government to introduce such a scheme and they are quite interested. So if I just go back into a little bit of history here, my, this is a picture actually of my mother. She's on, on the left here. She's doing work study and training. And this is our first sewing room in 1965. They started the business in 1961, which was before I was thought about. And this is what it looked like. And I imagine many of you have long memories of what sewing was like in those days, but it was a big thriving industry. My own grandfather was born actually in Leipzig in Germany, and he studied art and portrait painting. And his wife was a concert pianist. And I think that's where art and music combine to come into fashion. And my father was a fashion designer for many, many years. So they started out like this, making clothes, making garments, mostly in nightwear at the time, and initially white label for other, other retailers before they created their own label. And over the years, we've done the exact opposite, would you believe, of modern management theory. Rather than concentrate on our core activity and subcontract all the rest, we just bought more and more in-house. And as UK suppliers have gone overseas, We've bought machinery and kept production here. We now do everything here. We have our own call center in the factory. We have our own flower ranger. We have our own joiners, cabinet makers. We have our own canteen with our own people cooking. We have our own engineers. We write our own software. We make our own fabrics, our own catalogs. We print our own fabrics uh, and we sell our own garments. And so if we just translate this picture forward by about 50 years, this is the fabric cutting today. And this next shot is one of the sewing factories we have today. We actually have five uh, factory buildings here in, in the town of Alfreton. And this is, this is one of them. So this is what we do. Uh, another picture here is of the knitwear sewing uh, or knitwear skills. This is, this is linking. I don't know if any of you are involved in knitwear at all, but you start with yarn, you write a computer program, which operates a, a, a fully fashioned knitting machine, which, which uh, makes the various pieces, you know, the front, the back, the sleeves, the collar, etc. And then you link them together like this. So this is the, if you like, the makeup of knitwear. And what we've seen before is the makeup of, of fashion, garments, cut and sew. And our route to market, instead of selling through retailers, we only sell direct to consumers, direct to private individuals in their own home. And we have brought the catalog, this catalog and online, of course, and the catalog was the first thing we brought in house. And this is, this is a shot of inside our catalog printing factory. And this is the, the manager of the catalog printing factory. And what he's doing is he's checking the color composition, is checking the dot gain, et cetera, on the catalogs. And if I just look around this room, this is a shot of the, of the factory here. And in this factory, we're producing our own catalogs where the photography, all the models have been shot in our own studio here in Alfreton. And these are in different languages, in different currencies. And in here, we produce around 5 million brochures a year. And every single one is mailed to a private address of a customer in one of those countries who will then hopefully order directly from us. Now the next stage for us going further back in the supply chain is to produce our own prints. And we've done this, in fact, since Brexit. This is an absolutely brand new uh, operation to gain more control of the supply chain. Everybody's complaining about the supply chain. It's always a problem, isn't it? The supply chain, there's too many links in the supply chain. And everywhere there's a link, there's a weak link. And everywhere there's a, there's a link, there's a middleman. So if you can make things yourself in-house, of course, you cut out the middlemen, you cut out the delays, 
cut out the customs, you cut out the transport, you cut out the paperwork, you cut out the waste. And instead, you can just concentrate on producing just the quantity you need at the right time in the right quality. I'm not saying, of course, that we should bring everything in house, like growing our own cotton or making, I don't know, zips or something like that. But you can apply the Pareto principle and try and produce um, maybe 20 percent of the components would produce 80 percent of everything you need. And so that's that's really what we're doing here. Now, the idea of bringing print in house is so that we have less suppliers and fewer base cloths. We used to buy prints from maybe 20 or 25 different suppliers all the way across Europe and around the world. And everyone would use a different base cloth and everyone would have their own prints and some would be good, some would be less good. And those base cloths would vary in, in the way they drape and the way they hang and the quality and so forth. And so by concentrating it in our own factory, we can, we can just have one base cloth for Jersey cotton, one base cloth for viscose elastane, one base cloth for silk, one base cloth for swimwear fabrics, etc. And then on that, we can print any design of our choosing or dye it to any color that we like. Um, so we've learned how to do the design. And of course, if you can design yourself, then the prints all become exclusive as well. And that's a benefit. If I just flick on to the production of the textiles, and you are the Textile Institute, so you probably know a lot more about this than me, but this is one of our printing machines. We've got two printing machines and they are digital prints. And the advantage of digital prints is it uses no water at all. And you can print exactly what you need. So if we need um, 1,200 meters, we can print 1,200 meters. If we need, 83 meters, we can print 83 meters. And if we need one meter, we can print one meter. There is no waste, there's no minimum dye batch, and it's all done to order. And so we can just run it off. And this is a machine which actually was built in Italy. And this particular machine uses reactive inks, which print onto natural fibers. And we have another machine I've not got a picture of, which uses acid inks, which we use for uh, silk and swimwear fabrics. Now, actually setting up a print factory, I, it didn't occur to me just how complicated or expensive the whole thing was going to be. But the printing, in fact, is almost the easy bit. The more complicated and expensive bit turns about to be this bit here, which is the print finishing. And this is a view uh, inside the print finishing area. The, 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 the printer is just to the left of this picture in a little side room, which is air conditioned. But when you've printed the fabrics, you then have to run them through a steamer, which has a dwell time at 104 degrees. Then you have to run them through a washer to wash off any excess ink. And then you have to run it through a stenter. And that's the big machine, which is right in the middle of the picture. It's just a big, long machine, a bit like a hotel toaster, really. It is, it's for drying the fabric and setting the width. And this machine also adjusts the, the way the warp and the weft lie or the the, the rows and the whales, and it reads every single line so it can adjust for the skew or bow or, or any twist in the fabric to make sure it comes out absolutely straight. In fact, in the distance in this picture on the right hand side is uh, a compactor, which we think hardly exists in the UK, but I think a compactor is something you need for jersey fabrics. And many of these fabrics, including the one which is in the picture, are a jersey or a knitted fabric and they all get slightly stretched as they're going through this whole process. So you have to use a compactor to push it back together again, uh, push the stretch back together so that the fabric won't then um, stretch um, or distort too much when the customer receives it and starts to wash it. So those are our various operations, sewing, knitting, catalog print, fabric print. I didn't show you inside the design studio, I'm sorry about that. But there's another area I would like to share with you, and it's an area which is particularly close to my heart, because after 60 years of surviving the boom bust economy which we've had in this country, we've come to the conclusion that actually longevity isn't really about design, it isn't really about machinery, it isn't really about finance or buildings or any of these things, it's actually about people. And if you've got the right people, 
you can survive almost anything. And our challenge, as is the challenge for most of the textile industry in this country, is to find the right people. Now, if the right people are not there because they've retired and 97% of the jobs have gone overseas, then we have little choice. To, um, we either have to go offshore ourselves or we have to start all over again, training the next generation. And that is what we've decided to do, even though it's quite a long-term project. And of course that starts with passing on sector skills to the next generation. And we can use the staff we've already got to do that. And we can pass on skills in design, we can pass on skills in pattern cutting, we can pass on skills in knitwear, in the print, in the sewing, and all these. And we have led the government trailblazer to establish the apprenticeship standards for many of these uh, textile skills in the UK. And these are what are being used and um, what companies can offset their apprenticeship levy against today. This shot is actually in the, in the design studio, and this is the sort of pattern cutting area, which you might recognize. But all of this depends, of course, on being able to recruit the right kind of people with the right attitude who want to learn and are hungry to get on in a career. And many people tell me that uh, young, um, young people these days just don't have the same attitude as they did a generation ago. And that is a problem. And so we have to perhaps go back even further. And I think that the attitude of young people is much more developed in those teenage years, those sort of influential years, than later. And it's, if you recruit people when they're already 20, 25, 30, it's very, very hard to change attitudes. You have to start younger. So we went round to look at our local school. And this is actually the local school in our town in 2016. And this is where all of the all of the young talent would come through to come into not just our business, but all, all business in all sectors, private sector and public sector in the town. And it turned out that this school was the worst school in Derbyshire. It turned out it was in the bottom 2% of all secondary schools in the UK for its attainment. It turned out it was only a third full. It turned out it had lost its sixth form. It turned out that the deputy head is in prison. And I thought, my goodness, if this is what's happening to the next generation of children, we really don't have a chance for another 60 years. And neither does anybody else in this town. So that's why we formed an education trust. And it's a multi-academy trust, which has been established with the Department of Education. And through that, we have sponsored the entire school. And the entire school has been rebuilt and this is what it looks like today. We are now five years in to this project. And this school, instead of being only one third full, is now the sixth most oversubscribed school in the county. And we have managed to introduce an employability angle into the curriculum. And it spreads right through everything we do, introducing the world of work from all, all different areas of careers, public sector, private sector, manufacturing, health and social care, construction, textiles, of course. And by introducing that throughout the curriculum and building the children's, um, building their team working ability, building their, um, their confidence, building their attitudes, building their emotional intelligence, we've managed to get every single child, every single child into a job, or an apprenticeship or a place in further and higher education. And we've done that last year and the year before. And theoretically, if that could carry on for a few more years, there would be zero youth unemployment in this town. And this is a town where just over half of the children are on free school meals. So we are amongst the most deprived towns in the UK. So that's, I think, a really good success. We've introduced, of course, art, music, fashion, drama, and all these things at Ofsted don't really measure. And this is what is attracting parents. And this is why they're now voting with their feet to send their children to come to this, this academy. And I think, it's a, I think it's a great pleasure to be involved in it. It's been a huge project. And you may say, what on earth are you doing when you're trying to make fashion, Christopher? Why are you wasting your time on education? And the reason is education is probably the future 
In fact, it has to be the future for all of us. So I hope, I hope that you've enjoyed listening to this uh, this morning, this afternoon. I hope that if you were thinking before that it's impossible to make clothes in the UK and sustainability is a distant dream, I hope I've shown it is possible and it's viable and it's profitable. And along the way, you can get recognition. And I've got a couple of pictures here. We've had a visit from the Princess Royal in 2011, which brought tremendous um, um, pleasure to all of the staff, took tremendous pleasure to everybody involved in the thing. We've had another visit from the Countess of Wessex just before lockdown. Here she is sitting at a sewing machine. She was absolutely game for anything, tremendous fun. She really did bring, you know, sunshine into into the workforce uh, she also came again and opened this opened the new academy for us so we've had in a way three raw visits which is fantastic and that then leads us on to the whole point of sustainability which might be the whole point of today's talk really which is sustainability and i'm very proud to say that we have been given a a Queen's Award for Sustainable Development. Now, most, most Queen's Awards are, in fact, for export or innovation, and there's only about a dozen or so nationally for sustainable development, and I think there should be many, many more. And so we're proud to be uh, the only winner in Derbyshire, and the only winner, in fact, in Der that Derbyshire has ever had since 1992, when the Sustainable Development Award was started. So, please, whatever your role in textiles, Please do everything you can to encourage young people and new people into the sector and to make it one of the best, best jobs around. We have, it's high time we made our own clothes again, and I hope that we can do that with the carbon checker idea. So I'm going to end with a video. And this video is 90 seconds long. And it gives you a glimpse inside the factory um, that we prepared for COP26 for the Climate Change Summit. And this was, has been carefully put together, and I think it sums up how the scheme would work. My name is Christopher Nieper, and our family business has been here in Derbyshire for 60 years. We make fashion and we employ 300 staff. But do you know, fashion is one of the world's worst polluters. It emits 1.2 billion tonnes of CO2 each year. But it doesn't have to be that way. And we are living proof that fashion can be sustainable. All of our five factories have solar power and we're very careful with our energy because cutting waste makes commercial sense and it's sustainable. British companies really don't need to source so much offshore, where pollution is out of sight and out of mind. I don't think British consumers should put up with this, and I don't think they would if they had a choice. So why don't we give them a choice? I suggest clothes should have a label, an at-a-glance carbon checker label, which rates the company which did most of the work. You see, consumers want information, and consumers are responsible when given the choice. Consumer choice is a powerful way of cleaning up the world's most polluting industries. Labels cost the taxpayer nothing, but every company needs to join in. So my challenge to our government is to embrace this idea and legislate to give consumers a choice and our planet a chance. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Christopher. Um, I think we've got all sort of slightly stunned into silence about what, what you've been doing. Um, but thank you so much for that presentation. It was extraordinary. Um, I think it's extraordinary what you've done. And I've got a lot of questions myself, but I'm just having a look now. We're getting a few more questions in now. Um, they're just beginning to come in. Um, a lot of comments, actually. A lot of the comments are saying, uh, what a fantastic way to go, really inspiring. Um, such an inspiring talk, lots of people have said that. Um, fantastic talk, it's good to see your company investing in education and training. And I must say that's one question that I would quite like to ask you actually. 
Um, is this a model, do you think, that others have either followed or other industry? I mean, big industry should perhaps be doing what you've been doing in terms of education. Um, is that something that you know has happened or has anybody, uh, do you know of other companies that have actually put a lot of money into education or invested in education in their areas? The, the only company I know that's done similar is JCB, and JCB is the large digger manufacturer, oh, yes. you know, those, those big yellow diggers. And they are an absolutely huge private company with much, much deeper pockets than, than us. But they set up an academy about 10 years or 15 years ago, specifically to train engineering skills. And they um, take children from all, all around their area. Their, their main factory is in Staffordshire. Um, pretty much in a rural area and they realized they couldn't get they couldn't get uh, good technical skills there and they were struggling to get people to relocate from various universities you know to get good graduates and they decided the best thing to do was to try to train graduates or tra train engineers from the local native population so they set up an academy and they teach GCSEs and A-levels with an engineering bias now what we've done is not to teach GCSEs and A-levels with a fashion bias, because unfortunately there isn't a fashion sector around here to, to actually justify it. So we've made this into a community school. So the, the focus is not on one sector, the focus is on um, local industry. So we've got about half a dozen key local employers that the parents in this area would relate to and would respect as places, good places for their children to work. One is uh, Denby Pottery, actually, which is a pottery company. One is a, a large construction firm. One is a catering butcher. Another one is a health and social care provider of um, um, sports halls and, and um, leisure centers and so forth. And there's ourselves. It's, it's quite, it's quite um, powerful because it fits to the local community and it provides any job. And of course, we don't want every child to come into our company. Why would they want to anyway? Yeah. They want them to go to whatever career route is appropriate for them. And the really powerful thing about this is the model could be used in any town in the UK. And that's why it's turning heads in Westminster because it could be used particularly in former uh, steel working towns, industrial towns, coastal towns, coal mining towns like this. And if it turns around a failing school as well, all the better. But Philippa, I don't know of any other company, and certainly nobody in the textile world, who's got involved in training and education uh, at this kind of depth. No. But it is nevertheless a, um, a model that could be followed, and I'm glad to hear that governments are taking interest in what you're doing. Um, so hopefully that might happen more. It sounds, it's, it just sounds such a um, wonderful thing to be doing, and such such a necessary thing to be doing, given the difficulties that we have with um, uh, with production in this country in any case. Anyway, um, I'm just looking at other questions that are coming up. Um, oh yes, here. Patricia Card Hardcastle has said, do you think your carbon checker logo will reach a wide enough audience for our private catalog dispatch? Um, no, no, it won't, but the plan is to make it to make it something that the government would want to introduce. Now, what the government would like to do is to get one or two major retailers on side with this idea. We're gonna develop it, or we are developing it with a university, um, you know, a recognized university to develop the criteria that would qualify for grade A, B, C, D, E, et cetera, where grade A would be net zero. If you can produce stuff at net zero, you get grade A. And if you're, at the worst sort of offshore level at the moment, your E or F right at the bottom. Now, the point is that no retailer, doesn't matter about catalog, online, retailer, all the lot, no retailer is gonna to want to stock garments that are E or F at the bottom. They're all gonna to want to show that they are further up the scale. Mm. And so in order to get further up the scale, they're gonna to have to find lower carbon sources. So you can either find a low carbon or no carbon source offshore and get it to the UK somehow without using any, any carbon, um, carbon or fossil fuels, or you can make it nearshore or onshore. And if you make it nearshore or onshore, then you're already gonna be climbing up because the UK has a very good proportion of sustainable energy in its grid. 
And if this, if this works, and if we can get this started, then it's possible for the government to then introduce a scheme like they've done for petrol and diesel cars, where they said there will be no petrol and diesel cars sold uh, after 2030. Imagine if they said that every garment sold in the UK will have to have a carbon checker label on after mm -hmm. a certain date. At that point, it doesn't apply to only catalogue, it applies to everybody. And at that point, every retailer, regardless of um, whether they're interested in finding the, the cheapest, lowest cost corner of the globe, or worried about pollution, et cetera, they'll be worried about carbon emissions. And that's the real thing, which is measurable, you see. That's what, that's what we're all measuring. And we now have what's called scope to one, scope two, scope three carbon emissions to qualify for net zero. We've got to work towards this by 2050 and by halving our emissions by 2030. And so actually by hanging the whole thing on climate change, I think we might just have the tiger by its tail here. We might just have a way of changing behavior of the British fashion sector. And it could happen in any country as well. And if, if this is not really asking for retailers to do much, it's asking consumers to choose. And I think consumers would choose to buy lower carbon um, garments if they possibly could. And I think retailers would seek to do, deliver that for them. So yes, it's not about catalog, it's about the whole sector. I think, Philippa, one thing we need to just ask Christopher to clarify, please, because a few people are asking that, including me, um, just to clarify what the different letters mean, A through to. Oh, yes. Yeah. If, if you could do that, please, I think that would answer quite a few of them. Well, it's it's a bit like um, an energy label on a fridge. If you buy a fridge or a freezer or a washing machine in a, in a shop, that gives you an idea of how energy efficient the, the thing will be to run. Um, or like a, a traffic light system on food, you know, you have um, uh, green, amber, red to show how much salt or fat there is in, 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 in foods. Um, so it's that kind of, it's, a, it, it's literally color coded from green through to red and a scale a bit, a bit like the, um, you know, the white goods. And the qualification to what exactly how much carbon per garment would be A or B or C is what is going to be defined by the university. In fact, um, in fact, they're working on it now, where A would be zero and E would be how we currently are in the Far East, probably in China at this point in time. And I think we just grade it evenly in between. So that, that's the grading system. It's the principle that we're, we're trying to establish at this point. Thank you. Well, I hope that helps. Um, there's another question about the labelling here from Wendy Ward. Um, really impressed, she said. Would the carbon labelling include the raw fibre and fabric and how easily garments could be recycled, reused at the end of their lives? Does, um, that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah it's, you know, it's, a, it's an extremely valid point. And I think one of the reasons that uh, no, no label has actually gained any traction in the UK or in Europe or anywhere is it's so difficult to measure this. How can you possibly um, know whether people, other than by doing a survey, whether they wash something once and throw it away or never wear it and throw it away or whether they wear it for 20 years? How can you possibly track back through the supply chain right the way back to the grower, et cetera? So it's very, very difficult to do that. So the whole point about this is it doesn't get involved in all of those things. It just concentrates on the one thing which we can measure and which is the, the energy consumption of the factory that makes the garment and the main components, the main fabric, the, the label inside, which is the washing instructions, which says 100% cotton or 65%, 35% cotton or whatever. Whatever that refers to is usually the main, gar the main fabric in a, you know, in a dress, it is, it is the main fabric. So if we just do those, then we're really dealing with something which we actually can measure. And in terms of our, um, our drive towards net zero, which we have to do as a company, we have to measure our scope one and scope two emissions. And, and scope one really is the, the emissions from the factory itself. And that would be practically zero, or it would be zero for most, most textile factories because we're not, we're not um, making concrete or making cement or smelting metal or something like that. So we're not actually emitting that from the generation of energy. So our main, our main uh, area is what they call scope two, which is the um, carbon emissions created at the source 
for the energy we use. So if we're burning electricity, if we're using electricity to run sewing machines, knitting machines, printing machines, et cetera, where does that electricity come from? Has it come from a coal-fired power station? Has it come from a gas-fired power station? Has it come from wind or solar? And all of that is easily measurable. And we have a certificate from our energy supplier to say where the, where the uh, energies come from. And we can pay extra to have green energy. And we can, of course, reduce the energy we use by generating energy ourselves here. And we have solar panels on every single factory roof. We have heat recovery. We have heat pumps to try and reduce the energy we use. And so if we get the energy reduced down as low as possible, and the little bit we do need to buy in is from green sources, then we are adding no carbon at all as a result of the process. So if we, if we use that methodology, which is the way, um, it's almost like using the country of origin rules, which we need to do for customs. The country of origin is the, uh, where the company um, that adds more than half the value is the country of origin. So you're not tracking right back to every last, every last bit of thread or cotton, et cetera, because it's almost impossible to do. We're just concentrating on the one, the big things that you can manage, and then all the rest sort of flow with it. And if we could have low carbon, which means making in, in the UK, then I think you'd find that um, garments might cost a little bit more, which means people would buy once and wear many times rather than buy once and throw away. It would mean that people would wash and wear it more often. It would mean that people would be more careful about what they buy uh, and choose, um, you know, choose more carefully. So you change behaviors by just changing that one main factor. That's, that's the principle. And I think trying to measure everything is nearly impossible. <laughs> Well, indeed, yes. Um, can you? Uh, you said that all your factories, um, uh, you have solar panels. Uh, is all your power taken from solar from solar energy in your factories? Yes, yes. They all they all have. Uh, every roof is covered in solar, but unfortunately, the sun isn't out all, all, all the, the time. time. I, that's so, what I wondered. So, yes. so we can't we can't um, you know. And, and in the winter, of course, the sun is lower in the sky. So you don't get quite so much and, and the daylight uh, hours are shorter in the summer. You get it higher in the sky and yeah. the daylight hours are longer. Yeah. So we can't get 100 yeah. percent, but no. we can we've approximately reduced our our energy bills by half by having solar on the roofs. Fantastic. And we've reduced it by half again by recycling and reusing energy within. So we're down to about a quarter of the energy we used to use and that quarter now comes from sustainable sources as well. And those are things that any, any factory can do. Very good, that's brilliant. Um, I'm just looking through the questions again. Uh, uh, something from Frank Moore here. Um, Christopher, he says, a brilliant concept, but can you not develop it further by working, marketing and selling your products with other UK retail retailers? We could, um, thank you, thank you, Frank, for that. The, the thing is, we, we, are, we cannot produce as many garments as we can sell. And the last several years, we've been absolutely flat out, increasing the capacity of our own factory. Um, so we actually don't need to sell through other retailers. Um, at least we haven't for the last, for the last 25 years, in fact. Um, and I think there's an underrated factor here, which is brand Britain. The whole thing of buying something that's made in Britain is, is a real cachet. And that, that adds quite a bit to your sales without doing anything. If you look at, if you look at there's quite a few niche brands in, in other countries. I'm looking at one this morning in, in France and, and every, almost every picture on their website, they say the fabric is made in France, you know, knitted in France, et cetera. And it's a, it's a real positive. And it might be, I don't know, you may or may not agree with this, but I think globalization is past its peak. I think the whole world of, let's get everything from the cheapest corner of the globe, uh, regardless of its environmental cost, is past its peak. And now is the time to investing in local manufacture. And of course, you don't only reduce your carbon, you get short lead times, you get low waste, you get just in time, you get higher margins, you get better customer service and all of these things. So thank you, Frank. I would, we may need to sell through other retailers one day, but at this point, we don't. Oh, thank you for that. Um, another question here from Estelle Hutchful. After 60 years of building not just a business, but an entire ecosystem for fashion, which includes education and training, where would you advise someone just starting out creating products in the sustainable fashion industry to start? 
more specifically, do you focus on sustainable textiles or um, a specific part of the manufacturing process? You, you've got the yes, question. I've got that, yes, yeah. Yes. Look, the, the, um, the first part of your question, where would you start? Well, you know, you, you may or may not agree with me here, but one of the best ways to start a business is with no money. And I say that because you've got nothing to lose. So if you start with a very, very small, uh, small amount of cash, you've got very little to lose because inevitably you do make a lot of mistakes. You make mistakes all the way. We still make mistakes now. And uh, if you start with very little to lose, then you have very, very little to, you know, your mistakes are quite controlled, if you like. So the way I would start is if you're a designer, is by actually making your own garments. We, we started, or my parents started with, with one person. My mother cut the garments out on the living room floor. My father designed them. And we had a retired sample machinist from a local company who did a few hours part-time and made the garments. And that way we found out that some garments didn't sell and some garments did sell. And then when you've got some that do sell, then you can afford to hire somebody full-time. And then you can afford to hire two people to work full time. And then you just build it from the ground up. So I know there's no magic formula, but the best way to start might be small. Now, the second part of your question, in terms of do we focus on any, any one area? Well, natural fibers has, has become the focus over the last few years. But consumers have not really they're not really buying so much because it's a natural fiber or because it's made in Britain. Those are nice to have. They buy because they want the garment. They've, they've got to want the garment. They've got to think, I'm going to look a million dollars wearing this. They've got to choose to wear that garment. And then if it's made in the UK, they might pay a bit more for it. If it's sustainable, they might pay a bit more for it. They might treasure it a bit more, etc. And those actually become USPs and qualities that you can add to your, your designs as, as, you, as you go on. I hope that answers your question. Yes, that sounds like a, a good answer. I'm just trying to catch up at the moment there um, because there are some questions in chat, which I hadn't noticed yet, which I'm just looking at. Um, Janet, have you noticed? Yeah, I've, I've been checking those as you've been going on, so it's fine. I, I think that's, um, you know, it, it, it's OK <laughs> and it's growing as we go. Yes. As well. So may, maybe uh, um, Janet Prescott's question, your um, efforts in education, have your uh, fascinating efforts in education started to counter the real reluctance to join the making side of the textile industry, which has dogged many efforts to reestablish fabrics and fashion in the UK as a desirable profession over the past two decades. The lure of designer and media proving so strong in these, in, in so many areas. How can this be done? That's a, that's a lovely question. The, there's always this feeling that there's a stigma about working in manufacturing. But um, I don't know about you, but when I was young, I didn't know what manufacturing involved. If I didn't know what, what any career involved, really, and you end up with a maybe a, a careers advisor or someone coming into your school and saying, here, tick, tick, um, tick a load of boxes, here's 50 questions, and at the end of that, they tell you what kind of career you might do. Well, that's pretty ineffective, I've found. And by far the best way is for young people to experience different roots into the world of work and choose for themselves. So if we can get young people to come into the textile business as children and see what it's like, they might think, wow, this is it's not what I thought. It's really quite good fun in here. And we start actually with the primary schools. I, don't, I know I didn't show you that, but we start with the primary schools and we run a, an annual event called Fashion for Free. And we have about uh, 10 or 12 primary schools who send, uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred children in. And that what they do is they spend several days making something in their school for free. And that means um, recycling and upcycling and reusing things that they can find in the school and they can find at home. It might be finding something in granny's sewing box. It might be a bit of newspaper. It might be, um, you know, lids from milk bottles or something like this. And they make something and we set them a theme and they come into the factory and then they show all their designs. Uh, and we then award lots of prizes and everybody wins a prize, etc. 
And then they go home to their parents and they say, guess what? I've been around this textile factory and it was really interesting. And then we can translate that same principle into secondary education. And here, what we're doing is we're getting uh, examples of the world of work knitted into the curriculum. So we can teach maths with examples from the world of work. We can teach English, we can teach history, we can teach geography, we can teach all of these things with examples from the world of work. And then the children have an opportunity to go to the pottery, to go to the construction firm, to come to here. And all the time, they're not just uh, almost choosing their own career route. They're also going home and telling their parents what they've been doing. And this may be a surprise to you, but since we've been sponsoring this academy, we've now had about 2,000 applications to join the company each year. And these applications are not actually coming from the children. They're coming from their parents and their parents' friends. So um, it's about creating a buzz about what it's like in manufacturing. And you know, manufacturing is a great job. Why wouldn't you want to do it? That sounds a brilliant answer. I'm, I'm terribly impressed by your the whole education side of it. Having been in education myself, I've always been very interested in that. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Janet, have you seen other questions? Yes, so the, there? there's a, uh, quite a few questions. I'm <laughs> sort of generally rounding them up slightly. So quite a few questions about people being worried about trusting the labelling um, and how can you be sure that it's very accurate um and also the um type of fibers that are in there does it necessarily cover those as well um so they're those kind of questions um i don't know if you want to say anything about that uh christopher i just keep that fairly general yeah um it's not looking at the type of fibers um, because that's, of course, so difficult to, to measure. And the impact of those fibres is looking at the, the carbon footprint of the manufacturer, because the carbon footprint of the manufacturer, you can get it less by making it nearshore or onshore, which creates jobs. Um, and the way to justify the higher prices of manufacturing in the UK is, in fact, to use natural fibres. So it all kind of brings that together. In terms of the trust, of course, it needs to be... Um, certified in exactly the same way as food labels are certified do, do you trust the food label on the side of a, a you know a packet of crisps or you know a, a, something you buy in a supermarket it's exactly the same thing so it won't be us that's judging uh, or, or certifying any any factory it will be an, an independent certifier which will be this with this trade body there's a quick answer for you on that one Okay, um, I think we're probably maybe coming towards the end of the questions now. Um, yes, Philippa, I'm is there any more you want to? I'll just compare with the carbon footprint. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sort of coming to the chat side and there are some more questions there. Yeah. Um, um, I was just looking at this question, which you may have answered already, but is, again, it's to do with the carbon checker. Um, how does it compare with the carbon footprint, e.g., does it work on the same principles? Um, but but you've already described um, the letters A to E, so I think maybe you've answered that question really. Um, it's it's one and the same thing, isn't it? it it's, is. it's the carbon yes. footprint. Yeah. It's the carbon footprint of the, of the manufacturer, and all we're trying to do is. Um, use consumer behavior to change the way things work. Look, I don't know whether this will be successful or not, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an attempt, you know, and there's been multiple attempts uh, for, for decades to, to get some kind of labeling scheme going and um, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but I think it's, it has a, it has mean, a chance. Could you um, encourage other manufacturers to join you um, yes. in putting this forward and have you had a response from other manufacturers um, within within your industries um, yes. to support you in this. Yes, well, um, I've been introduced to five other manufacturers so far, and all of them have said yes, they'd like to do it. Uh, as soon as the thing is um, developed, they would like to do it. And I think this might be a question for you, Philippa. Can can you help us? Can you help um, introduce other as an organisation? Can we help? Um, yeah. In, in a way, I mean, we need to we need to set the 
criteria first and uh, you know so the scheme is set out properly what ABCDE etc means etc but I think one that's once that's going if we if we can get a, you know a, a quite a, you know a, a few UK manufacturers that would give more comfort to the government Absolutely. and it may much yeah. more likely to introduce it and uh, the, the current government at least are, are very interested in, in this right now so if you can help help yes. us Philippa, please please do Yes, well, I think we shall we shall have to put the word out around um, among well certainly through the textile institute. We should really try to see if we can engage with other other companies um, to help you on that because it, it's such a good initiative. Um, and really, what I have been most interested in, I must say, is the way that you're including the whole of the community in in your endeavours because you obviously realise that without the community, you have no you have no future, you have no sustainable future in any case. So um, the education side of it, as far as I'm concerned, is something that I've, I've, I've been really interested in. And I think that's a lot of the questions have been about that as well. So I'm again, I'm just checking on here. And it was good to underscore. Can you see anything else, Janet? I, I think we've got the main ones, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, but we can read out a couple. An ideal subject for developing a certifiable okay. British standard, which can then be developed into an ISO standard. So, so there are things there, and I think there's certain things that we can discuss uh, as part of the Textile Institute, certainly in our section. Um, we can look at that to see if there are ways of helping. And I, I just wanted to say to Christopher that you, you've got such wonderful comments here. I'm looking in the chat box. It's great to organise such an interesting webinar um, and uh, what a fantastic way to go. Really inspiring. Such an inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Fantastic talk. It's good to see your company investing in education and training. Um, amazing, amazing work. So, so there's absolutely loads of um, wonderful complimentary comments here, especially in the chat box um, and elsewhere as well. So I, I think everybody's very much on board with um, trying to help this initiative. And I would say to people here, um, a couple of people also asking how they could contact Christopher. Well, I would suggest, unless Christopher, you want to say otherwise, you. You just Google the company David Nieper and you can write to that company or contact them through the um, the addresses on, on the website. Um, would that be OK, Christopher? Or would you want to? Yes, of course. Of course it would. Or, or, or please, um, you, you introduce your members to me as no problem at all. Janet, it's a very humbling experience hearing those those comments. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, it's been an enormous pleasure and a privilege to talk to you. We, we will today. certainly discuss it um, in our committee meetings as well. And anybody who's watching, if you have any ideas or um, things that you want to take forward or ways that we can help this initiative, then do please contact the London and South East England section of the um, Textile Institute and, and we will look at those and make connections any way we can. Um, and I would just like to thank Christopher because I totally join the, the sort of thank you section here. It's been a wonderful presentation, um, incredibly inspiring. And, and it's just what we need right now. And we need so many more initiatives like this and companies like yours and uh, anything we can do to help, we, we would be very pleased to do so. So thank you, Christopher, for today. Um, it, it's been a wonderful presentation. Yes, and I must add my thanks to that as well. Thank you again, Christopher, um, for doing it. And um, we hope we have reached a lot more people by um, doing, a, the, doing our, our events on Zoom. Um, so anybody who has been watching um, and has come to this presentation and doesn't know enough about us, do get in touch with the Textile Institute um, because we will we also put on a lot of other events as well and other sections also put on events.
So um, the Textile Institute itself has a, a very good website which you can have a look at and you can find all the events that will be happening actually on the website. Um, the website is quite new and it's growing and getting bigger all the time. And as we said at the beginning, this, this talk has also been um, uh, recorded. So we are hoping that we will get it up onto the website um, as soon as we are able to. So that, that would also be helpful for everybody else. Um, so unless anybody else has got anything else to say, I think I will just complete this now, Christopher. And thank you again very much for your wonderful presentation. And I shall just, we shall just keep in touch and see how far it goes. Um, we will obviously try and help you if we can. We certainly will. Thank you.